Hi, my name is Drid Garn. I'm a psychotherapist and the bulk of the work I do is in the field of complex trauma and gender diversity. I myself identify as a non-binary transgender man and today I'm going to be talking with my colleague Pam. I'm Pam, I'm a psychotherapist as well, I'm also head of research with Blue Knot Foundation. Um, I work with complex trauma clients, I'm especially interested in dissociation and I have a client I'm really looking forward to um, discussing with Dragan and I know um, he's got a client that he's going to talk about with me and I'm really looking forward to the conversation we're going to have. So I hope you find our discussion useful. Hey, Dragan. Hey, how Pam. Are you? How you doing? Yeah, good. Oh, good. I'm so glad you're available to, you know, have a quick chat. I've got a client I wanted to talk about with you. Um, I think I'm. I kind of know what I'd like to do. It's a, it's, it's just a, a first session kind of scenario, but it's quite complex yep. so great to have a chat if that's okay um yeah no I, and I, know, I enjoy that yeah thanks i know you know the brief details but just quickly recapping um it's leanne she's 28 um she's with her husband who um she came with her husband actually she's seen a lot of therapists and she said none of them were any good so that's one of the mm -hmm. presentations you're immediately on your metal a bit um yep. and i've got a letter from her gp um which has information from the treating psychiatrist that she had a very violent background. Her father left when she was three. She lived with her mother, but there was sexual abuse from the mother's boyfriend, and she was thrown out of the house um, after her first overdose at the age of 16 and has lived on the street, trading sex for food until she met Rob. Um, and she, it seems to be quite a close, good relationship with Rob, but she's very up and down. Sometimes during sex, she's very distressed and starts screaming. Rob doesn't know what to do. He's very concerned. Um, she, she doesn't want to have sex anymore at all at the moment and she's having flashbacks of the sexual yeah. abuse and very depressed um, and she's cut herself to stop voices in her head. Um, I know from the letter from the treating psychiatrist that there's quite a lot of information that um, she's lost time. Sometimes mm -hmm. apparently she's gone shopping and she's even bought clothes that you know, she doesn't remember buying, doesn't identify with them as hers, and has also been lost in, um, you know, different places without knowing how she got there. So I'm immediately thinking, oh, there's obviously some dissociative stuff happening here. Mm. Um, the diagnosis is borderline personality disorder with suicidality. Um, so I just want you to just want to run it by you, get your thoughts, but um, my thoughts immediately, because I think this is quite high stakes. You know, none of the therapists mm. are any good. So she's... Um, very um, ambivalent about coming, but of course she has come back to therapy and I imagine she's quite frightened regarding what you think, you know, what's going on. Um, I don't well, think it would likes... be so scary, wouldn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. And the borderline personality diagnosis, which is often confused with DID, you know, now we don't know that it's DID, I certainly wouldn't be saying to her it could be DID, but I've flagged, you know, the lost time, not identifying with things that she's bought, doesn't remember them as hers and getting lost, it could well be. So it doesn't seem to me on the face of it that that may be an accurate diagnosis. I don't know yet, but I just want I to... I agree, you know, yeah, I agree. And look, it's, you know, I, I sort of hearken back to um, Bethel van der Kolk talking about if we can't get the diagnosis straight, then how on earth can we provide an accurate um treatment you know or an accurate plan for therapy going forward if we if we're not even being accurate about what's going on for her and I agree with you there's big big red flags for dissociation yeah and because therapists often aren't aware of dissociation as we know because we have going to work in this field um, no wonder she's suspicious and uncomfortable if if it is as we're saying likely dissociative and that hasn't actually been picked up and it's immediately been put in the BPD basket and obviously there mm. can be overlap of, of symptoms and, and mood swings and so on but of course there are differences with BPD and, and one of them is if, if it was DID um, it'd be more likely to be the case that um, you know the, the client wouldn't be remembering and, and owning and recognizing you know what have happened like my understanding is BPD people often can identify with how they were in different states they might not be happy about it but it's kind of like me up and down you know when you can look at mm. that but DID there's often a real um, you know discontinuity genuinely not knowing that part of themselves so if that 
if, if there's any of that there, which it looks like it could be, and that hasn't been picked up by previous therapists and she's been put in the BPD basket, no wonder she's kind of, um, you know, a bit spooked, a bit resentful, a bit unhappy about therapy. So I'd want to really, and I want to see what you think, really, um, you know, move away from that um, diagnostic lens in, in what I say mm. to her and, and very Absolutely. much, you know, assure her that I'm kind of client centered and, and that I'm not diagnosis driven and but I was wondering what you thought because at the same time I've got this information from the treating psychiatrist and I believe she knows that I've got the letter you know via the GP and although we always like to make up our own minds about people and not go on what's been said before especially if we think it may be problematic I thought there's really valuable information in that letter that she probably would know I know for me to actually put out to her you know from what I hear you know you're experiencing this and experiencing that and you know this could be and, and kind of get into a general um, you know exploratory tentative alliance building conversation about making sense of what she's experiencing. Yeah. Would you um, would you flag that with her I mean it's very early days but would you even um, start making some you know, because you're trying, it's obviously very frightening. And so would you be trying to um, give some information or share some information about it makes sense to me if this is happening for you because it's often something that does happen when people have experienced uh, overwhelming things in the past? Or would you be making that sort of oh, link here would, or would, would it be too soon? Yeah. No, I would with her, and I, it's a really good question. Thanks for. I wouldn't necessarily make that link with everybody, but in this case mm. with Leanne, I, I feel very. I think it's quite high stakes. She's very mm. pissed off with previous therapists. She's experiencing severe symptomatology that there doesn't seem to be any clear framework she's been given. So I would, without saying your DID when I don't know she is, mm. I definitely want to um, say to her, look, I notice you've got a BPD diagnosis. I don't know. You know, well, let's talk about your experience. But if anything, on the basis of what I, you know, your doctor said, I would suggest there was, you know, if, if there was any kind of disorder, it would be more dissociative. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if I'd use the word disorder, but I'd certainly introduce dissociation because that may be a totally alien concept to her and as you just yep. said it could be very reassuring to make sense that she's not crazy yes it's scary yes it's we you know we need to address it but it makes sense that you would be experiencing what you are if if it is dissociative rather than you know another diagnosis yeah and you could check that stuff out with her you know so it says here that you've lost time tell me a bit about that and you know dissociation would cover that experience and if you link it to it's actually resilience actually that your amazing being has figured out a way um to compartmentalize stuff that might have been too much mm, absolutely i thought that was a gifted opportunity to talk about how yep. double-edged dissociation is like when it first emerges it's it's very protective it's this extraordinary capacity like you said you know under stress for yeah. us but as with all things if we have to use something defensively over a long period and we haven't been able to address the underlying stuff that becomes the issue so we're mm. wanting to be reassuring her that this absolutely makes sense but also recognizing the impacts it's having on her life and how we might start to so yeah do you, what do you think I was I was thinking that would hopefully reassure her get some buy-in that she hasn't been put in a problematic basket and she's not going crazy but also yep. recognizing and that, that she's she, coping with heavy yeah yeah that she makes sense that's what you're talking to is it speaking to it she makes sense she's not some crazy person she's not just a diagnosis she's a being who makes sense yeah absolutely and given how we know that um you know, I noticed the suicidality that's in the in the treating letter. I mean, it may be suicidality, it may be self harm without suicidality because we know mm. that's often confused and especially not recognised as as dissociative as a coping strategy. So it's it's a good opportunity, I thought, maybe to explore with her. And I think I would want to explore what's going on with that. Um, you know, because often we know that we know because we work in the field, but self harm is often about um, self regulation. Um, mm. And people actually do it to feel better, not to necessarily, you know, try to genuinely kill themselves. So I'd want to explore what was what was motivating that. There may be suicide, but I, you know, it may well be self-regulatory. And um, I think part of it. Do you think, Dragan? I'm, I'm thinking she would even be relieved at one level to have this out there and addressed. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and that it's not a. Yeah. It's not like. Um, 
you know, this terrible thing, oh my goodness, you're self-harming. It's like, okay, look, this is happening. And there's often a reason that it happens and it often serves a function for people around regulation. Let's explore what it might be for you. Is it something that helps you feel relief? Is it something that takes the pressure off? Is it something that brings you back into your body? Because a lot of people who are dissociative use it to bring themselves back. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, the information that's been provided that, again, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure she knows that I know. So I can, you know, draw on that. And, you know, she does, um, you know, have, have, has had very early situations of, of abuse and sexual abuse. So what we were saying before about, you know, the coping strategy, the, the dissociative, um, you know, the way of, of, of part of the self being protective and if, if things happen at a young age, not being able to address them. So it is absolutely protective and makes sense that the child will kind of, I'm not just really tentative about how far I get back into early life, but wanting to, what we're saying, you know, give a, um, a sense of how the coping strategies that are causing problems now were protective initially. So she doesn't yeah. have a sense of herself as crazy and totally out of control. Oh, no, this all makes sense. We can address it. Does this seem like this is what your experience is? So I'm really hoping to do, yeah, client-centred and some gentle mm. psyche around dissociative symptoms because I doubt she's had that. So I'd probably want to do, you know, how we need to distinguish between mild, moderate and severe dissociative because we all, many of us see dissociation as a continuum and, you know, depersonalization mm. and feeling a bit disconnected or those kind of things. We all have very, that to a degree. Mm. Exactly. It's very normal. We all do it, you know. Um, and yes, of course, the more that we're trying to um, compartmentalize or we'll move away from something or avoid something, then the more extreme it might get. Um, but we even do mm, it in our mm. daily life. When we're feeling tired or overwhelmed, we switch off, we shut down. It's, it's a normal mm. thing. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think Would often, you, be... you know, when like, now you go. go. Now you go. Now <laughs> no, I'm just wondering about, <laughs> because it, <laughs> it's, um, it, it's, it's, you know, the first session and it's very, you know, you're working to build that therapeutic alliance, as you say. Um, would you do anything in the first session around regulation? Like, how would you approach that with her? I think my main thing, thanks for helping me to, you know, workshop the ideas with you. I, I, I may be able to, you know, gently kind of suggest some self regulate but I think my main thing in the first session would be to normalise her symptoms in the context mm. of a dissociative lens because it seems pretty clear um, in light of mm. that information about lost time and not knowing where she is, buying the clothes and not remembering. And I feel like if she could come away from that session um, with a sense that, oh, I'm not going crazy, um, and, you know, I'm, I, there's a bit of understanding here and, and maybe this makes sense that she may actually commit to, because this wouldn't be obviously a, you know, half a, half a dozen sessions and given the long journey she's had of, of not having good experiences in therapy, I feel like the buy-in would be the normalising, you know, gentle kind of mm. Um, self, I don't like, you know, self, psych ed, I used to sound like a teachy kind of thing, but I think gentle information around mm. association, which she doesn't seem to have had before, could be the buy in I feel like I need without minimising how serious it is and not spooking her either, but her going away with a sense of, oh, okay, maybe this kind of makes sense. Maybe I could start to, you know, address this rather than feeling that she's in the too hard basket or bounced around all the time. Yeah, and also some hope, like sending her off, you know, with some some hope that there's act, that it makes sense. And there's actually things that one can do, and there's things that one can learn, and there is there is a mm. path forward. Mm, mm, mm. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 She needs. I mean, she does obviously need a lot of um, safety building, which would be that would be a big piece of work, wouldn't it? Like people often say, you know, oh well, how long do you do phase one for? With someone like Leanne there's a big piece of work to do around safety. Um, there's probably a lot of developmental trauma in there because she's had that since such a young age. She's, she's been in a really um, unstable environment, a very um, frightening environment. Uh, so you could be working with someone mm -hmm. like her for a long time in phase one, couldn't you? Look, absolutely. And if, if it is DID, which we're you know, not sure yet, but if it is, obviously the self-regulatory stuff is, is more complex because depending mm. on what self-state the person's in, a normal or kind of soothing activity for one state may not be the case for another. So I guess that's another reason why I'd be 
a bit reticent about suggesting strategies in the first. I'd probably want to engage Rob a bit. Do you think, Dragan? I mean, it's good that he's in the room. Um, mm. and, and he could be kind of enlisted, quote unquote, to be support. He probably knows and notices things and he's maybe already doing things that are helpful or not helpful. So I would think yep. maybe, what do you reckon, I'd be kind of wanting to draw him out and obviously she feels safe enough that, you know, he's with her in the session and really mm. bringing him in as part of it in terms of what's going on outside of session and what could help in the meantime, before our second session, I'd probably want to set it up that I expect to see her again, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and maybe yeah. Rob could be brought in as a as a support around that as well. How how would you work with something like, because um, if he's there, sometimes, um, you know, people, she might, like, what if she brought up something like, yeah, we're not having sex because blah, 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 and it's, it's right there. Like, how do you work with containment? Because I think that's something people therapists and others really struggle with um, when there's disclosure mm. or it's, it's something's plopped in the room too early, so to speak. Um, yeah, what yeah, do you yeah, do yeah. around that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I noticed that, you know, the information apparently she's not having, I don't know, and Rob may be, you know, upset about that or, or is there something wrong with me? So I guess I'm hoping that kind of normalising of, of the, the symptoms, quote unquote, um, and giving some kind of, framework by which what they're going through as a couple would make sense um, mm. you know so hopefully because it all makes and, and that it's not personally about Rob I wouldn't let me say it's not about you but it makes sense in terms of coping with distress that there may be um, you know issues around that and um, there are things we can do like like you said there's, mm. there's ways of addressing this um, because it's very difficult for partners and I'd probably want to suggest that, you know, he gets some support from himself or maybe he might want to really not because he may think he's the problem and um, and there may be a dynamic in the relationship. I don't know. Maybe there mm. are problems. There probably are, but that's a really good point. Like if, if not having sex is an issue in itself and that comes up directly in session, that would have to be um, addressed too because that may be mm. like the main concern. Yeah. Yeah, and it might be, you look, there's, you know, that, that's an issue between the two of you. Maybe that's relationship counselling, but it's obvious there's a lot for, if Leanne wants to continue therapeutically, that's going to be very different. You know, that's a very different journey than their journey together. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you and I've talked about these things before, and it's really, people often over-identify with, you know, they come in with what an immediate issue is. And it's like all of us, we often don't make a connection between a painful experience we're having in the here and now to what's gone before. So I'm hoping it, it might be helpful for both Leanne and, and Rob to be able to, if, if the sex, not having sex anymore is the issue in the room at the time or that comes up, um, to be able to kind of get a sense of, well, you know, that kind of is understandable that that, that could be happening given, you know, mm. Um, and rather than, it, you know, there's no rhyme or reason or the relationship's not working or there's something wrong with, with either of them, that that makes sense that it would, um, you know, there may be a protective aspect to, to feeling very exposed and triggered around it. But again, that that makes sense in context, but there's things that, you know, down the track um, that, you know, can be addressed. So it's a really mm. good point that about dealing with what's in the room because I've got all these ideas but maybe what comes up immediately is we're not having sex anymore and why I can't ignore it with <laughs> yeah. it, you know <laughs> but yeah. I think that yeah. that that framework of under the dissociative lens if that hasn't been raised with either of them and I suspect it hasn't hopefully that will immediately take down some of the temperature of what the hell is happening sense. to us yeah yeah why I had a question mm. as well I had a question Pam um around um because I work a lot with the parts approach um um like Janina Fisher would approach it or yeah, um, yeah, with the internal yeah. family systems model. And I, I had a question around with actual dissociation, um, would you use that same kind of approach like to bring out, um, say, resources or resilience or the fact that there's, yeah, there's a part that might want to leave as in suicidality, but there's also a part mm. that's come to therapy. Like, would you use that approach anyway, even when it is something like dissociation? Yeah, I've I would, and I think the beauty of the part stuff, and and you know, I know Vanderhut and people who work in complex trauma, 
say this too, the beauty of the part stuff is that we can use that framework with any client. Like what like we just mm. said, we've just segued, haven't we? Like there's always the part of me that this, the part of me that I'm like this mm. in this situation, not in the other. Now obviously if it's CID, the, the parts are more separated, there's often less co-consciousness. Um, yep. You know, it, it, it's, it's a different degree of separation of parts, but the model of parts itself, I agree, is incredibly helpful and yeah. I would probably absolutely get into that quite early. So it would hopefully um, be a bit reassuring for both Leanne and Rob that she can be very different at different times potentially. I would want to, yep. you know, normalise we are all different in different situations and sometimes if, you know, there's been um, very distressing situations in the past that can be more... Um, you know that the shifts can be perhaps more rapid or, or more extreme, or and, and it makes sense that that there may be forgetfulness. So I think it segues really well from the parts mm. that we all have to getting into the parts of DID which are more rigid and 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 more separate, but is a kind of normalising way of talking because we can talk like that to all our clients. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Mm. And you know, if there's a part that's freaking out during sex, you know, it's not. Leanne, the whole of Leanne, you know, it's it's finding ways to, okay, yep, this is happening. And there's probably a reason that's happening that makes a lot of sense. And maybe we don't need to get to that reason yet or even um, approach that yet, but it's enough to know that it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned Janina Fisher, and that's really helpful because you've reminded me. I'm Janina Fisher's really strong on this, isn't she? She wants to move away from the language of I with trauma mm. dissociation, encourage the client and, and ourselves to start using parts language. So getting back yep. to your point, you know, thanks, it's really helping to clarify as I speak with you, rather than you know, her going with strategies, which I don't think would work very well, if she can leave that first session in starting to think about parts you know, if she finds herself mm. doing something or role point, it's the part of me that, oh, part of me this, rather mm. than this assumption of a coherent self and I, which with severe dissociative stuff, people just don't experience that. So the language is not helping. So yes. I'd definitely be using parts language in, in that way. And hopefully that would be a bit reassuring that Leanne has a sense that that's understood that a lot's going on inside that she doesn't make sense of and that she doesn't identify with all the time either because there's various parts in different directions. Yeah, and even and then introducing that concept that sometimes a part can actually take over to the degree that we don't remember where we were. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah. And there may be parts yeah. that, that jump up that actually are very functioning as well, like when she, I don't yep. know yet enough about her life, but a part that takes over to get her through situations that copes really well. So like we say, we don't want to pathologise the parts. You know, some of them are probably stepping up and doing really good and it's only the, the ones that are causing difficulties that are, um, you know, that she's focusing on. So all of the parts well, she are has, serving a purpose and, yeah. Yep, and she has a very strong or survival part or parts that have got her through, which is extraordinary. You know, she had a part that was able to get away and actually um, survive on the streets and found ways to do that. I mean, there's a lot of resilience in that story. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think I definitely want to, to validate that too. Do you find, Dragon, it's always a, a dance between strengths-based and recognising what people are still up against? So, so I'd want to yeah. absolutely validate what, how she survived and how, yeah, that's really good, but also indicating that, you know, it is a struggle, it is difficult as well yeah. and, and seeing, seeing it, the, the parts, you know, the parts that are really getting on with life that, you know, and doing well and extricating from difficulty, really validating that because she's probably down on herself for what's not going well, um, yeah. but also empathise with the bits that are still difficult but that, you know, make sense in light of dissociative stuff, which, as we're saying, she probably hasn't had any discussion or, or connection around. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's an important point too, isn't it? Because we tend to get these catchphrases like strengths-based in, in our service provision. And, and yes, it's great We because we know we want to bring out um, there's going to be a resilience narrative in there as well, but we can't diminish the very real struggles in people's lives, you know. Um, mm -hmm, absolutely. But we don't want to yeah, just yeah. focus on them, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I feel really strongly about that. There's a lot of people who look to be and are in many ways resilient, but according to external criteria, oh, you're in a job, you're in a relationship, be da 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 da. Mm, and people can, yeah. some people can jump, oh, that's really strength, but can completely miss what is the subjective quality of life of the person. And because I see exactly. a lot of dissociative, I, 
I really try to clue the, the, the surface presentation can be immaculate. You know, we see that often mm. that we with dissociative clients, and and it's not yeah. safe often to to present differently. So if we're just saying, oh, you're doing really resilient and you're in your job, and but what's it actually like to be? You know, um, what's the experience of of, of being oneself? So celebrating the strengths but also recognizing the challenges yeah 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 well that's really helpful thanks dragan i needed a bit yeah no it's very interesting isn't it yeah mm, mm. it sounds so, like you you know yeah. you've got um good groundwork set good places to connect with her and it's all it's all going to be around that connection isn't it because she's had not very good experiences of therapists before so it's going to be you know getting getting that connection and probably very very transparent and not being the expert she'd probably react to that I suppose if she's had a lot of that before so really forming that alliance we're we're doing this together yes I've got stuff to offer but so does she she's going to know more about her experience than we could ever know yeah, no, no, no. But Leah, like you said, if it's often you've got time to segue into the relational connection, but I feel that needs to be there from the get go with this because mm. we've had so many bad experiences um, and trying to kind of, yeah, impart a sense that it, it makes sense and we can work on this. Um, yeah, rather than taking a long time into it, it's really important that, and that, yes, yeah, so she's seen as a client and a person and, and her experience rather than the, the labels and so on. So, yeah. Mm. So, thanks for that, Dragan. That's been Brilliant. helpful. No worries. Mm. Thanks. We'll have okay. to do it again. Okay. Go too. well. Yeah. All righty. <laughs> thanks. Okay. See you Bye. Bye. Bye.